Dr. Jordana Jacobs is a practicing clinical psychologist in New York City. While clinically she has a general practice, her research primarily focuses on the relationship between the awareness of death and our capacity and willingness to love. She gives talks and leads meditations aimed toward helping people accept their inevitable mortality so that they can live and love more fully. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jordana. Thank you so much for having me. So to get started, I'd love to just have you talk a bit about Um, kind of your background and how it is because I'm sure everybody listening is wondering how it is that you came to talk about something um, so specific and so important but also uncommon as this sure Um, so I think that this can best be described in sort of two stories Uh, the first being that I would say that my family survived death Um, or cheated death because of love. My great aunt was a Polish Jew living during the Holocaust, and she had false papers. And she was living in Poland and working, and she was pretending that she was a Catholic woman. And she met and fell madly in love with a man by the name of Rolf Peschel, who happened to be a German officer. And about two years into them dating, as she was pretending she was Catholic, she decided to finally tell him that she was, in fact, Jewish. And uh, the story goes that he, he left for about two hours, and she had no idea whether or not she, he was going to turn her in to the Nazis. But he came back, and he told her that he was deeply in love with her and that he would do everything he could to save her life and to save her little sister's life, who was my maternal grandmother, uh, who was about nine years younger than her. And Sandra, my great aunt, actually said, you know, you actually, it's not enough to just save me. I need you to save the lives of as many Jews as you possibly can. And so he saved dozens of Jewish lives by providing them, continuing to provide them with false papers. And there's actually a tree planted in uh, Yad Vashem in the Holocaust Memorial in honor of him. And I think he's one of a a handful of non-Jews who there's a tree planted for. And my great aunt spent, I think, about 20 years of her life when she was able to finally come to the States trying to get this tree planted in this man's honor because he saved so many lives uh, because he loved so deeply. So I think I I grew up hearing sort of endless stories about the relationship between love and death, about how I'm, you know, ultimately believing that that's why I'm alive today. (laughs) And uh, part of the reason why I talk about this topic. And then the second story that I think relates, and that's maybe a little bit more personal to me, is I had a sort of long-term romantic relationship in my early 20s that was very meaningful to me, and I fell deeply in love for the first time. And I decided to end it. We just didn't fit, but I was still so in love, and I was in so much pain. And it was right around the time of, of writing this dissertation, and I had to come up with a topic, and I, I started to feel as though Now, I realized that the only thing that gave me solace was recognizing that I was going to have to lose him at some point anyway, that I was going to have to say goodbye, whether through my own death or through his, and that this fallacy I had of forever was actually making me cling to this love in a way that I think was detrimental to us. And when I really started thinking about the fact that this loss was inevitable, I, a lot of the anguish, a lot of the pain, a lot of resentment towards him, uh, guilt, tor- you know, anger towards myself for, you know, quote unquote, ruining this love, all, all of this sort of melted away. And I found it to be really the one saving grace for me. So to just <laughs> sort of wrap it up, I know this is kind of long, is the, the, 
the story and the journey, my legacy, my family legacy of the Holocaust, to me is representative of how love can save you from death. And the story, uh, my personal story around my, my relationship in my 20s is really about how death and the awareness of death can save love. So what I do is look at this, the two sides of this coin between love and death. In kind of hearing that story and thinking about love and death, but also just love and loss in general. And as you mentioned, love is the only thing that can kind of save us from death, but also overcome death. Mm -hmm. And so I think back to my grandpa, who's actually a 103-year-old Auschwitz survivor. And I mean, generosity from other people, but also friendships he made um, and the motivation to get out. I have a friend who told me the Donner Party, the people who survived Mm -hmm. were the people who had something waiting for them, who had someone waiting for them. So that love being what what gets us through and helps us kind of avoid death. And then in overcoming it, I mean, there is literally nothing. And I know I wouldn't be where I was today if it weren't for the people close to me who gave me the love I needed to fill the huge void that death can create that is just this empty vastness and the only thing that can help i mean there's time but it but it's really just love and so really recognizing that and then through your work and what we try and do with bbxx as well is like recognizing that and helping people live their lives according to that and really valuing those relationships and the the kind of invaluable things um that they provide in your life it's so beautifully said a couple things one is that it's sort of what you're saying reminds me of this nietzsche quote that i love that says he who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how and this was a quote that i was i used a lot when I was doing something called meaning-centered psychotherapy at Memorial Sloan Kettering with advanced cancer patients. It was part of a study that I worked on as a research assistant, and then I went back as a therapist years later. And that was a quote that was really almost like a mantra. And the why to live for is almost always love. If it's not love, then it could be the why could be stronger, uh, that why. It could be intense love or passion for what you do sure but most of the time you know, there's a frank ossoseski founder of the zen hospice project which says that after seeing countless people die the only things that really matter are there are two questions that people ask themselves at the end of life and it's am i loved and did i love and that has to do with relationships it has to do mm-hmm. with human connection yeah and how kind of at the end just all the value you and all the purpose that you feel is, is tied back to those relationships. And if it does truly happen that your life flashes before your eyes, I can't help but think it would be nothing other than the faces of the people you love most, hugs, mm-hmm. smiles, and that's there's there can't be any way it would be anything else. Right. The only other thing, and you sort of commented on this before we actually started, was that there's a relationship we develop with ourselves. Mm-hmm. And... I can imagine my life flashing before my eyes and having, seeing moments in which I felt deeply connected and loving towards myself. Like Mm. after a 10 day silent Vipassana meditation retreat, really feeling embodied or I'm trying to think when else, but there have certainly been moments in nature. I mean, you mentioned Chile. That's where you said you were. Chile, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hiked a volcano in Chile and I slid down Amazing. the ma- the volcano. Was it Osorno? Maybe. It was years ago. I actually did some sort of Jewish trip and I s- you like slide down. You hike up this volcano the entire day. I don't know if you've done it. Oh. And you slide down it like almost like a bobsled. Amazing. And it was the most, one of the most yeah. beautiful experiences of my life. So I could see that moment because yeah, yeah. I felt so deeply connected to myself and nature and so much bliss and joy. So I think that was a moment of really like loving, loving. That activity makes, kind of brings up 
extreme athletes if you Mm -hmm. if you think of that and such a tricky relationship I think between love or or life and death and Mm -hmm. that some people truly only feel as though they are living their best self or living their best life kind of living on that edge and it's worth that gamble to them but how hard that is for the people around them and how hard I mean I think all of them unlike most other people actually are kind of living in the front row without illness without it kind of being as much a sure thing or not but those people every time they engage in those activities have to know that statistically speaking it is very possible they might not survive sometimes and so kind of the cognitive dissonance but also acceptance of that Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read the book Stealing Fire no oh it's so good I highly recommend it Uh, it. it's about the various things we do to get into flow states and and they could be meditation, it could be sex, it could be uh, cliff diving, all of these experiences that help us move out of the default mode of our brain and into a more sort of entropic state, or psychedelics is certainly one of them. Mm. They talk a lot about extreme athletes and how uh, getting closer to these near-death experiences, yeah, makes you feel, first of all, you can't think. Your frontal lobe sort of uh, shuts down. You're just doing. You're in survival mode. And w- how thrilling that can be, sort of to quiet the, the ever-present uh, chatter mm-hmm. in your mind. But yeah, I, you know, I actually also think that a lot of what you're talking about has to do with control, so when you feel like you can control how close you get to death to a certain extent, mm-hmm. and it's your choice to jump off the cliff, it's a very different feeling than when you've been pushed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, you know, or if you were diagnosed with cancer. Mm-hmm. These brushes with death are feeling like we're in control of them, whether or not we actually are, change everything. Because it has to do with safety. Is it being done to me or is this a choice? Right, so, so I talk a lot about death primes and bringing consciously and purposefully bringing thoughts of death into your awareness as a way to remind yourself that life is impermanent. Yeah, and that's a very different thing to have an alarm that goes off on your phone every day to remind you than if you were hearing bombs every day in the morning to remind you. Right. Right. right? Yeah, and trying to think about how possible it is for people who haven't kind of had these firsthand experiences how much can we really help them conceptualize how real it is and how um kind of impending this is and so you do certain death awareness exercises that i think is one example of how of how people can kind of do that i don't know if it ever actually is enough to make up for having experienced it but if you could talk a bit about those death awareness exercises sure so ideally they're done in the context of real safety and before i even go there i want to comment on something you said about how death can be this great tragedy or it can be something that really opens us up because i just this past weekend was in san francisco at a Holocaust survivor's home. Uh, he was in his 80s, and he also survived survived Auschwitz. And my boyfriend and I were running a Love and Death Salon series, and we had invited a number of people that were they're sort of like rock stars in the death world. So this woman that had have created this conference called End Well, that's incredible. Um, another person who helped who produced uh, an Academy-nominated short documentary film that's on death, uh, the head of palliative care at Stanford, all of these incredible people. And we just posed the question to them, you know, what is this relationship between love and death? How can we better understand it? And ultimately, the conclusion was that exactly what you just said, that death is inevitable and there's two different ways to handle it. We can contr- constrict and, and be terrified, or we can open up and it can be this surrendering 
to both death and love sort of simultaneously. It can be this vehicle towards deeper love and meaning in our lives. So the, the real question is, what is that bifur- bifurcation point? How do we move from a place of fear to a place of opening? So I'm just wondering from your experience with patients or in research for those people who do find themselves sitting in the front row, what are kind of the different reactions you've seen and, and different kind of evolutions of those people's identity, be it for better or worse? I'm seeing a patient who has cancer and is now actually within the last two weeks is in remission she's 30 years old and terrifying cancer with and a rare form of cancer married and is i started seeing her when she wasn't when she was still still very much had cancer and now no longer does and she, her life has changed so dramatically in a way that she is able to really access her awareness of her mortality and has dramatically changed what she wants to do with her life. So there's, there's that. And there are also people that I think have these experiences where they become aware of their mortality people that have maybe cancer that is less life-threatening. Cancer is always life-threatening. It always brings up thoughts of mortality. But let's say you have stage one prostate cancer and you just want it to go away and you have surgery and it's done. A lot of people then react in sort of this different way where they then shove death under the rug even more. They had this experience again that's the like turning towards and opening and allowing versus the contracting and the closing and then i would also say that there are people who become aware of death and they realize that they when it comes to those questions those two questions at the end of life am i loved and did i love and they realize that the partner that they're with or the relationships they have with their family are not allowing them to have those peak experiences of love they'll distance themselves or they'll try to change it so there are people that will will have some sort of awakening around that and say i don't want to be with my partner anymore i'm not having that fulfilling relationship in the way that i know is possible or i'd like to hope and believe is possible so i'm going to leave and I'm going to search for somebody with whom I can have that so that before I die, I can experience that kind of bliss. So as we're talking about kind of family and how this, these realizations create maybe a, a new closeness or, or the want for change, um, how do you think that procreation or the need or desire to procreate is tied in with this fear of, of loss? It's huge huge so uh the studies actually show that when we are primed for death so again those thoughts of death are brought into conscious awareness we want to have babies men have the desire to have more sex women specifically have the desire to procreate it's a way of literally leaving a piece of ourselves behind when we leave this earth it's our legacy I wonder if somehow it comes from a place of selfishness because it's really us wanting to pass on something of us beyond our own death. Yeah, I think there are, I think, again, it's about intentionality. And I think when we become conscious of how much we do to cope with our fear of death, then we actually can make more of a choice about it. When you're not conscious about it, it's hard to know. We don't know how much of procreation for each of us has to do with this desire to cope with death. Or I wonder if it's almost as though it it lessens that it's not a full death because part of you is continuing on. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of the the concept that we actually live three deaths in life. And I believe it's that the first is when kind of the the body dies. Um, The second is when we are buried. And the third death is the last time that someone says your name. And so in 
procreation and in also loving throughout life and creating intimacy and close relationships, we carry more of ourselves forward and therefore die a little bit less and live a little bit longer as a result. Right. Which brings us back to love. Right. So when the more we love, the more deeply we connect, the more deeply we're remembered. And so I wonder how much of this could be evolution and how much of it could be cultural or sociological and so how much maybe it's changed or evolved over the years Mm -hmm. the the strength of this fear or whatnot and I'm not sure if there's research as to how maybe it could be different across cultures is it something just totally global such as facial expressions or is this something that um, kind of is based in could be different based on values or religion or, or, or communication where in some places this fear is is right in front of people's eyes versus being shoved under the rug. Totally. I mean, I studied abroad in northern India and I started my real investigation into death and death awareness and how cultures, different cultures cope with death by living in a Tibetan community in Ladakh, which is the northernmost area of India. And the way that death is thought about in in countries that really embody Buddhism, where transience and impermanence is so natural and actually reincarnation is thought of as what happens after you die, for the most part, I feel I'm a little agnostic about that. I don't really know what I feel about the idea of reincarnation, but it is a very soothing, certainly, way of thinking about death. You don't really die. You're just reborn. (laughs) Um, And I I was actually told that the Buddha himself didn't come up with the concept of reincarnation. It's not straight from the Buddha, but something that was sort of adopted by the culture. So sometimes I think that reincarnation is just a coping mechanism to when the Buddha started talking about exactly uh, how about impermanence and transience. And people got scared and said, just kidding, we we die, but we actually come back to life. Don't worry about it. But I found that death is talked about far more openly in Buddhist cultures. I firmly believe that the more we accept and embrace and allow inevitable mortality and surrender to it, the more we're able to surrender to love. And that's, that's the key, actually, in, in my message, because if you just say, accept death, people are going to be like, absolutely not, no mm-hmm. thanks. But if you can realize that they're so deeply connected, then you have a real reason to accept and embrace death. If it allows you to love, which is all we really, truly want as human beings, and be loved, love and be loved. The loss of somebody is horrible horrible and there's not to be underestimated and i'm no way saying that you should experience you know the death of a of a of your husband and then say like oh this makes me want to love more that's some like pollyanna bullshit that i'm not trying to preach what i am trying to say is that we need to be aware that that's a possibility and by possibility it it's inevitable it's inevitable in our lives that we will lose. And instead of resisting that so hard and resisting it so hard when it happens, because the resistance is is futile to a certain extent, uh, because it's inevitable, that allows for potential meaning and potential love and a potential opening that can make that process something that is a suffering with meaning rather than a suffering that is devoid of meaning and just pain, just pure pain. Um, Going back to that piece by Sam Harris where he says that no matter how many times you do something, there will come a day when you do it for the last time. Mm -hmm. And that while we've had 1,000 times to tell the people closest to us how much we love them in a way that you really kind of resonates with you. You feel it and you make sure that they actually feel it as well Mm -hmm. and kind of understand the strength behind it. 
that while we've had so many opportunities, we've missed the vast majority of them. Or we haven't even missed them, we've just choose not to act on them. And so kind of the importance of that, but I also want to acknowledge how hard it is to, to actually do that. And that for some reason, I don't know if it's cultural or psychological, that I find myself wanting to do this so often, but it's not actually that easy without it being extenuating circumstances when you're in the front row, when there mm-hmm. is a threat, and that it feels so much more genuine that when it's just every day on a Saturday morning at brunch and you want to tell your friend how much you truly care about them or tell your siblings how proud of them you actually are in a real, real way that is so meaningful, it's not that easy. <laughs> it's not that easy and it like feels weird or it feels kind of over the top. Right. But how can we get rid of that and why yeah. is it that way? Because... I think that's part of the reason we we don't do it. And without that block, I think that actually people could change the way they live in, in their relationships and the communication in the way that we've been talking about. Yeah. Such a beautiful question. You know, one is I think it takes practice. You have to practice this. So you have to practice really feeling it first. So that's why I think these death meditations or these death primes where you can really drop in and feel it. But to really like look at, sometimes, you know, I just look at my hands and I'm like these and it's not going to, this whole thing is not going to be here, right? Um, so practicing those, that death awareness so that you can really feel that love on a daily basis so that when you say these things, they're imbo- they come from an embodied place, not from just this, like, I know I should be saying this. And two, I think just the way you described that sort of conflict, I would urge you actually just to be very open about your process whenever you say it. So if you're with your brother or something and you want to say it, be like, I want to say this, but feels a little awkward and weird because it's sort of out of the blue and I'm just meeting you for brunch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I like do want you to know how much I love you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to frame it uh, by being really open about what the, the issue is for you and why you almost didn't say it, but why you really want to say it, we forget that we can tell the people we love in a safe place like pretty much exactly what we mean. I don't know how your brother receives love, but that's something to be mindful of and aware of too. Some people have a really hard time Mm -hmm. uh, being able to receive and accept and then uh, Mm -hmm. embody through transmission of that love, um, which might make you say like, ooh, now I feel even more uncomfortable saying it or doing it. So finding the person, finding that language, or maybe you know the five languages of love, like how, how that person needs to hear Um, and feel love in order to really receive it. And I think that acknowledgement that reciprocity isn't kind of a contingency, like isn't Mm -hmm. necessary, perhaps. um, Yeah. And that you just wanted to say it for the sake of saying it and they don't need to say anything back. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps in certain cases you already know how they feel and that they have the same struggle. Um, But but you do know because... I think if we do go with all these missed opportunities at the end, if something happens to us, we wonder if the people did know if we hadn't said it. Are there any kind of other findings from your research or or experiences um, or insights that you'd like to share? Yes, actually. I have started looking into ketamine-assisted psychotherapy as a means to become more aware of mortality. So there's psychedelic-assisted therapy, there's psilocybin-assisted therapy, and MDMA-assisted therapy, but both of those substances, those uh, medicines, are Schedule One. So you can only do that sort of treatment in the context of a, of a clinical trial or a study. And they've been done at NYU here uh, and at John Hopkins, where they've shown that when you prime, when people come and are talking about or thinking about death, because they've done these, these studies with advanced cancer patients, that they do psilocybin and they come away with a, with a decreased fear around death, decreased death anxiety. 
and are more open to that love and to that surrender of uh, what's going to inevitably happen to their bodies. So for me, I've been really interested in doing this work, but it's really hard to, first of all, there are no active studies right now, which is really frustrating because there's a lot of therapists that want to do this work. And there are a lot of people that want this help, especially after Michael Pollan's book came out, How to mm-hmm. Change Your Mind. Uh, there's so many people that are saying, please, can we do this? And you know, the FDA hasn't caught up yet, so we, we can't. But ketamine is schedule three, which means that a psychiatrist can prescribe it to anyone. <laughs> so it, it doesn't have, you don't have a full on psychedelic experience like you would with psilocybin where you're seeing visuals necessarily. Uh, but ketamine is a dissociative and you have a different experience of reality. And whenever we have a different experience of reality, it helps us check in with our the reality we experience on a daily basis in a different way, right? So it's almost like if you have a fish in water, it doesn't realize it's in water, but if you dye the water uh, blue <laughs> or you take it out of water, then it then it's like, oh, this is, this is my life, this is my reality. I, I see it in a different way. I didn't even realize. So these, these supplements or these medicines help us change our reality so that when we come back to this reality, we view it in a different way. And I actually had my first ketamine-assisted therapy session myself as a patient because I wanted to see what it would be like if I wanted to do this with patients. With a psychiatrist recently named Will Sue. Uh, who does this? He has a company, or a yeah, a company called Cura K U R A. He does ketamine assisted psychotherapy, and I had a session with him on Thursday, so just two days ago, and it was powerful. It was so amazing. A that it's legal, so that's wonderful, and B I had this experience of being outside of my body and of feeling the part of myself that is not this body that will die. So feeling connected to a self that is not part of this ephemeral body. I don't know what's going to happen to that self necessarily, but when, when this body dies, but to just feel like there's a separation between the two. I could imagine being very soothing if you are sitting in that front row. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also think it's just an interesting process, really, for anyone that is, quote unquote, healthy. You know, everyone's dying in a certain sense. It's death awareness. It's death death awareness, right. So the goal, actually. Yeah, the whole thing. They're the same thing. Death awareness (laughs) is the same as life awareness. Um, But the goal is to maybe be able to have these group ketamine uh, psychotherapy processes where people contemplate mortality and then it's integ- the process is integrated later. It makes me think of um, ayahuasca and the trips that people mm-hmm. do, um, I think generally to Peru or I'm totally. sure in other places, but it's kind of these group activities and this you know, rebirth that sounds enlightening and terrifying at the same time being the person that I am where I'm convinced I would be the person who never comes back uh-huh. from, from the drug. I was once I just, that person. I would just live yeah. my life. Yeah. Um, but that's really fascinating. And I I think I'm, I'm going to read Michael Pollan's book. And I think that the next time we talk, especially after you having done more of these sessions, mm-hmm. it'd be really interesting to dig deeper into that. Because I also have no doubt that People want to hear more about it. Yeah, let's like do the, an entire yeah. another session okay, on perfect. how psychedelics I can, can help you manage death anxiety. And I can I can um, interview people. And, oh yeah, there's yeah. a lot of people that have been are talking about yeah. this right now. Interesting. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today, and hopefully that at the end of this, our listeners kind of have a better grasp whether or not they they like it or accept it or want to understand it but the the reality that kind of your life is on lease and yeah. um as one of the quotes in your salons goes that love and death are two of the greatest gifts that we're given but they often go unopened 
Yes, it's a real good quote. But yeah, and I just want to say that if anyone has chosen to listen to this the whole way through, this is a death awareness exercise in its own right. And um, I hope that it's left you with a feeling of more presence and a desire to love as deeply and richly and as meaningfully as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to listen to the BBXX podcast. You can learn more on our website or on our social media at bbxx.world. And if you believe in what we're doing, please do help spread the love by sharing this with someone you care about. Until next time. Thank you.